Okay, well, as usual, uh, uh, this is the, the panel between uh, Sergeant John Benetton of Unit and my beloved Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, played by the enormously popular Nicholas Courtney. So I would make no more ado than call Nick out, and I think we should do a dual panel now. Make the questions interesting if you can. And so, no, I mean as opposed to like different and interesting. And don't be scared to ask questions. You, nobody's going to look at you. You know, just well, you know, just ask the question. And, it's all going to come down. Hello, Roger, on camera number one there. So, uh, as soon as Nick is ready, uh, uh, I will announce him. In fact, here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for Mr. Nicholas Cook. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Okay. Well, you know the panels by old now, so let's just say no more than ask for the first question, and I beg you, don't be shy. Yes, sir. Okay, well, uh, my yes, I mean, the reason I make such a big point about being shy, scared, and, and timorous is because I was. And then, um, if you've heard of England, there was a, a place in England called Salisbury Plain, and on Salisbury Plain is a place called Boscombe Down, which does all the top secret work for the whole British Air Force. And I had a job up there as a labourer. Before I became an actor, I was a labourer. Well, most, most actors are labourers in the beginning. And I met a guy named Don Smith. And I wondered why I was scared of everybody. It's mainly because I was scared of my father. It's the oldest story in the world. No love, no affection, no nothing. So you end up thinking everyone hates you or doesn't want to talk to you. And that is indeed how my mind worked. And then one day, I'm making it slightly quick because we get lost of it. And one day I was on this building site and uh, it was a huge complex. They were building the first domed roof on an aircraft hangar for, for nuclear missiles, we now know, in solid concrete. And it was the first time it had ever been achieved. And I've never been like a butch guy, I'm not very good at fighting, and I'm not very good at being sort of macho. So what happened is I noticed one guy who had a lot of mouth, and he was always funny, Don Smith. Whenever anything happened, he made a joke about it. And when we used to play cards with these tough Geordies and these Scousers, which is a Liverpool guy, we used to play cards, and he'd actually look at these guys who could break your head with one punch and say, get your money in, get your money in there. And I'm thinking, my God, they're, they're going to kill him. But he did it with humor, and I decided that next to God and Jesus, if you like, humor must be the next best weapon. And that's when I decided, shit, I am not going to be nervous and scared anymore. And that's why I've ended up with this motor mouth, as Nick so kindly called me this morning. But that's the secret. Humor certainly is the most important thing, and uh, later on this evening I shall be exhibiting some humor in the variety show. In fact, uh, quite a monologue of humor, I think. Yes, it's the best weapon. Now, anyway, your question um, about uh, when did it start? Well, it sort of came naturally. If you play the part of a colonel, or a brigadier, or whatever, and everyone else is under you, it's, it's quite easy. Uh, you don't have to, I mean, they, they have to obey you. That's the rules of the army. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been in the army myself for self-discipline and things like that, which I exercised. I think everyone, it's very good that everyone should use self-discipline. Because discipline actually leads to self-discipline. Um, it's an extremely good quality to have uh, in life, and uh, I suppose it was in, in Debbie Gibby. I don't know whether I worked very hard at it. I mean, I never, a little bit, I didn't mean years and years and years ago when I started acting that I'd become most well known as playing an army officer, particularly because I was private in the army. Uh, and I'm not a person who can lead, probably would in real life lead anyone anywhere except possibly a stray in the bar. But, um, <coughs> without sort of any difficulty. But as regards the character development, it did develop. I developed it as far as possible to give him more humor, more humanity all the time. I started to write, I was allowed to write my own lines, rather than just barking orders, which is, um, gets a bit boring for the actor, and probably rather boring for the audience. What was the line I had barked at you in um, uh, Invasion of the Cybermen? I sort of barked an order through a walkie-talkie saying, well, one of the guys who was playing my cat at the time, his Christian name was Jimmy, and I had to bark an order to him, and I had to say to him, Jimmy, I want you to get on my chopper and tell Benton to lay on a jeep. That's a very hard line to say, you know, without cracking out. I digress. Okay. 
nice question. That's a nice one to start. Play any more. Yeah, Debbie, to your, just to your, to your other side. No, you turn right. I was going to say left hand side as you turn right. Yes, sir. When you were working together, did you find uh, that the roles sort of went beyond the filming? Like, Nick you know, would be giving you orders to get coffee and... <laughs> That would be far too easy and far too tempting, and it's not really my style. I'd ask him to get me a coffee if I wanted to, but I think he was rather too busy looking after the government, John Pergley. I had to fend for myself, unless I could find um, some sort of nose private to do it. But no, 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 I'd always learn to um, be self capable and self contained and do things for myself. I think it's very important. Um, I, I have sort of a pride that way. But Unless I can't do something, in which case I will ask someone to help me, because that makes good sense. But we did all sort of help each other. I mean, I helped John because he had a, a knee where the kneecap would go out sometimes, and I was one of the few people that had the nerve to hear the crack of it going back in. And so I used to look after John. I used to go tour England and see with John. John, if I have any comedy in me at all, and sometimes one wonders, but uh, he taught me, he forced me up on stage, and uh, you should have seen John Pertwee in his heyday. He did, you know, cabaret all over the country. I mean, not only is it lucrative for John, I mean, it wasn't any good for me, but I learned the art of traveling, the art of having to get out of a motor car at one o'clock in the morning, change in fields and gents' toilets and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what I think makes show business so exciting, changing in gents' toilets. But, um, no, you know, you're flushed with success and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, nice John, John certainly taught me, and I think uh, I didn't uh, travel around as much as this John. I better still call them by their surnames, otherwise we'd get confused with the Johns. But see, Perters and Levers or something, or Victor Burley. Um, but I, what, I, what John Pertley did teach me was to, because I was rather like Pat Trump to begin with. I was very, well, I was a very private person. Pat Trump was a very private person. And it was through John that I sort of learned to, uh, how do you put it, uh, come out of myself, go and open face and do that sort of thing. That learned coming much later to conventions, doing that sort of thing. And uh, I think that all that come, came from encouragement from John. Yes, there's a question just there. Oh, sorry, excuse me. When you're not working, um, what do you guys do for fun? What kind of hobbies do you have? Well, uh, what do I do for fun? Well, I think life's quite fun, actually, anyway. I think uh, I try to enjoy life. Um, I'm a very gregarious person. The reason, and this is serious, I'm very fond of pubs, and that's associated with the big deal. Why I like pubs, I mean, John got, got me straight away. He said, you're a pub man. So I, and he thought I had a drinking problem. I said, I haven't got a problem with drinking. I love it. What's the problem about it? But no, that, that, that's being a guy. Um, I like going to pubs because I like the company in pubs. I find it's social. I mean, I can have one drink, hardly anything to be completely sober. But uh, leaving that aside, um, one of my great passions is horse racing. I'm very, very fond of horse racing. And um, I follow it. And I used to go to most race meetings once a week. We had a little flutter, never too much, but um, well, I, because I'm far too cautious a person to do that. I think it's a wonderful sport. And um, what other hobbies? Well, hobbies, uh, writing, of course, I like to do and haven't had time to do much recently. I would say that my two chief, well, the m most thing I like to do is to be a writer, actually. That's what I like to do. Well, hobbies for me, I used to be a golfer, but I don't uh, play too much golf in California simply because it's just too expensive. Uh, but uh, my lady and I, we, we run the mountains to, to keep fit and for the fact that there's not a soul up there. There's 28 million people in our valley in California. And we climb these very small mountains, I don't know, they're 800 feet high, whatever, I'm not sure. But it's isolated up there and it's so beautifully hot in Chicago. After 47 years in England, I'm very, very grateful to be living uh, in, a, in a sunny climate. Um, I too, I, I'm learning to play bass. Uh, bass guitar, not to be like a musician, but just, we got rid of television. Uh, Jenny and I got rid of cable television a year and 11 months ago. And, uh, well, you know, it's, I, we feel sane now. All that time you spend in front of the box. And so I've learned to play bass, and I may attempt to play a couple of teeny things tonight, but it, I think, again, what Nick said is life. I think we both had, it's not so much a tough life. Everybody, I think, has a tough life. But when you realize that you, you've got something like Doctor Who behind you and you wonderful people because I say this every year, but you're the ones that are the stars really because if you didn't come here, we would be nothing. You know, you don't, you don't become anybody by nobody watching you. So it's just fun being alive and traveling all over America. 
I'm, I'm, off, I'm off to Australia in January for my first trip. And uh, so just being an ex Doctor Who actor and just seeing all these people again, you know, it's 30 years we've known each other. I just seen Nick Courtney's son for the first time. And like, you know, I haven't even seen my own son for nearly five years. So here we are all together and John Pertwee, that's, that's what it's all about for this moment in time. So. Based on your experience of working with all the different doctors, could you give us a description of what the atmosphere on the sets were based on who the doctor was at the time? Is that for Nicholas? Both of us. Uh, what, what was the atmosphere on the set? Did you say? <clears throat> I found the atmosphere on the whole the same. It was always, we worked hard and we played hard. It was a family feeling all the time in that program. It's uh, the family feeling and there have been several doctors and lots, lots of producers, lots of different companions, but it's always been, I mean, there's no time for any prima donna business at all. You've got a job to do, and you have got to get on with it. And it's a uh, tremendous esprit de corps. I, don't, I didn't find that the atmosphere on the set changed with any uh, of the doctors at all. I mean, obviously, certainly, one of these happened on the set, and I can never remember what they are, but, um, I found the atmosphere largely the same and very convivial. Well, I, I concur with Nick to, to the point that, um, yes, I mean, the atmosphere didn't change, but one's own personal views. I mean, I'm slightly more, uh, I take more risk and tell people slightly how I felt, but in a way, Nick is right. I mean, I can say now I enjoy working with John the most because uh, Tom Baker had his own set of rules when he came into Doctor Who. As far as I was concerned, uh, I knew Unit was going to die because Tom all the writers or producers had to move on. And so I think it is, it does come down to the individual's way of looking at things. When you think about it, the reason I love John Perfect the most is because we had Roger Delgado, Katie Manning, Nicholas Courtney, Richard Franklin and myself. And never, ever have I ever worked with such a happy band of people. And from the moment we got into the rehearsal hall at 10 o'clock in the morning until the moment we left. And then the awe-inspiring moment when we walked into the studio. And then you'd have, like, we'd have our guests, sometimes our family, or there'd be outside people up in the viewing boxes with glass, uh, you know, glass walls. And when that uh, introduction music came on, and the PA would come up and say, stand by Nicholas for your first scene, or stand by John, remember you're in the laboratory scene or whatever. The, the, your stomach, I think the churning and the excitement and the anticipation of, is this going to be another wonderful story? Keeping in mind, that we didn't know we were going to become a phenomenon. You must remember, like when you make a record, you don't know it's going to be number one. You dream it will be. But um, so when our show was there, the heart that we all had, I think, showed through. I don't think any other doctor had so much heart as our time, but that's only my opinion, because I'm a little bit sensitive in that area. I can't perform if I know someone hates me. And that's what my whole problem was in the beginning. Now I don't care if anybody hates me, because I cannot do anything about it. So that's how I felt. Um, for both of you, I'd like to know, when you guys were doing your, the show, Dr. Who, uh, when you were watching the doctors, you must have done something at some time that really made you want to crack up and laugh like crazy. What were the incidents that really stand out that you saw the doctors do these that you start busting your gut? What was... Well, it, it's different to, 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 to remember a scene that the doctor did. It, it, the funniness came from whatever would happen. I mean, like, the one that I involved John in, I don't know what story it was, but we had a scene where the monsters we were fighting in this laboratory, um, oh gosh, I, it, 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 we think too much to remember the names, but they were big globules or something, and we, we all had a scene yes. in the reactor place. The uh, jelly. Well, well, the jelly. Well, the three doctors. The three doctors. And, and at the end, when we, when we had to hit them with our rifles, they became invisible. And I, being always over the top, never knowingly underacted, um, I, 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 the director said to me, I need you to hold your rifle to swing at your monster, and it will disappear, so you are going to have to fall through it. And I thought, well, I'm going to be a little bit cocky here. I'm going to catch hold of the rifle further down uh, on the barrel to get a really big swing. And I swung this rifle. It was the first time I've ever had a standing evasion in the studio. And I knocked a whole row of fluorescent lights down, which knocked the mics down. And it was like devastation. And Pertwee stood there and gave me this wonderful round of applause. So seeing him applauding the destruction of the set, which then put the scene back about half an hour, uh, that is the kind of thing that one finds funny. But there's too many to really go into because there were moments of huge laughter. But a lot of us Nick said, you know, work came first. It's the unexpected that makes you laugh, you see. Uh, dear um, Douglas, Douglas Canfield, that wonderful director, 
he couldn't, I remember, understand it when he said, right, we're going to have now at a certain point a comedy run-through so that you can get rid of all your, what, the way you want to giggle, you see, and get rid of it on that one run-through. Alas, dear Dougie, he didn't know that it doesn't work that way. If you've tried to make each other, I mean, people try to make me laugh, they never do, John, you know that. I, you can't break me up. I break other people up, actually. Right? We won't go on about the iPad story, because everyone knows that. But um, it's the unexpected that happens, and, uh, and Douglas was rather surprised when someone would corpse and laugh in the middle of a scene later after his beloved comedy run through. But that's the trouble, you see. It's the unexpected. You can't predict what's going to happen. And it depends on your sense of humor, anyway. Okay, do we have another question? Just a couple more, because we have all three hours to go. Yes, sir. Uh, Nick, uh, how was it like working on the radio show? Can you tell us about the next radio show that you're doing? How, how what did you say? For the Doctor yeah. Who Doctor oh. Who radio show? The radio? Yeah, the radio show, yes. Yeah. So what do you want to know about it? Uh, the new one. Can you tell us about it? The new one that you're doing? Yes, it's called Ghosts of End Space. And I'm glad you asked me to tell you about it because I'm wondering whether I can. Because as you know, the Brigadier and sometimes indeed Nicholas Corby found all these things very hard to understand, which was why he was an army man, why he was a good foil for the Doctor. But um, it's, um, I mean, for example, the last one, The Paradise of Death, was about virtual reality. Well, I'm here to tell you, um, I've heard about virtual reality, but I don't think I understand it terribly well. And going back to The Paradise of Death, Barry Letts, who knew me very well, but the Brigadier, something appeals, he's an Epsom racist. Uh, that I could understand, you know, that is an identification with me. But when he wrote a scene about the Brigadier having pink toenails, I still don't understand why that was written. However, I digress. Ghosts of End Space. It's, um, it goes, it travels back in century. It, it goes to proceed to scene, it starts in the modern day. And the Brigadier, by the way, for your information, Barry Letts wrote to me and said, by the way, did you know the Brigadier had Italian blood? Well, I didn't know that the Brigadier had Italian blood. The proportion is about, I think, one-eighth Italian and seven-eighths uh, Granny McDool from Scotland or uh, thereabouts. And he's visiting his uncle Mario in Sicily. And uh, someone from Mafia. Oh, thank you. Okay. No, um, yeah, what came out? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Stephen Ford plays the villain in this. You remember, of course, Stephen Thorne, Azal, and Omega, wonderful, wonderful villain, and a very old and good friend of mine. He plays the chief villain. And then they go back to... They go back to the 16th century, and uh, there the Stephen Thorne again is playing uh, this guy, Maximilian, who in the present day is called Max, and he's uh, an Italian-American mafia, the present day. You know, can I tell you a bit about this? Well, no, I can't, can I? <laughs> I don't really know. It's, um, it's a, uh, about a lot of uh, very unusual monsters appearing, I know that. I think it'll be, um, I think it'll be very good, because the characters are so well-written. That's what I go for, first, the characters. Um, what else can I tell you about? Well, I can tell you it's in five parts. Uh, that'll do for the moment, I think. Until I, unless I think of something else, I think. Yes, Bill. I like the way uh, you and Nick worked together with John. And also, John, I was wondering if you had any plans to write a book. Uh, about Batman, or if you have, or whatever. Well, like all actors, yes, I, I, when I circumnavigated South America uh, on the cruise ship, I took it as a, a learning experience, and I learned an awful lot. I, I realized that this world is a huge place, and yet, it's, it's minuscule. The same things apply over the whole world. There's poverty, there's the rich that don't give a shit for the poor, there's politicians who don't give a damn for the people they politize over, and I saw it all, and I saw so much hunger, and the military might that I saw existing in Peru horrified me. I mean, we fought the Nazis because they were going to take the world over. And it's all going on. It's just a different name. And they have, they have gun and rifle towers around the car factories in Peru. And the people are in fear of even beginning to even begin to strike. So you ask me, uh, am I writing a book? I took a, I, I wrote a diary 
uh, a very long, deep uh, diary of my personal views, uh, religious view. I have no political views because I'm actually apolitical. And the reason I don't crack any political jokes is that sometimes they get elected. And I wrote it down and it's very good. I mean, I say good, I don't mean that I'm a good writer, but the, the gentleman I shared the cruise with was James A. Michener, uh, who's just finished another, yeah, he's one of your great authors. And he happened to be watching me playing bingo every day. I used to do bingo like with a Shakespearean voice. I used to really entertain them by doing it in a Shakespearean way. And we were giving big prizes, thousand dollar houses, you know. And every day, I used to see this elderly gentleman absolutely fascinated with, with me. And he was leaning on his walking stick. And it was then, uh, four days into the cruise, his wife Maria, I think, or Maui, or Maori, came up and invited me to what they call the Inner Sanctum. Uh, James A. Michener, being such a, a huge writer, was with two huge LA lawyers. Uh, Mal Marvin Mitchelson was one of them who did all the big. And these men had their own little room. And, uh, Mitch, uh, James A. Michener had been fascinated by me, I think, because I took bingo purposely to a new level. I mean, I just thought the, well, you know, I mean, how can you take bingo to a new level? But uh, I'm meaning that, that, you know, it's such a, a strange game that people don't usually expect to be entertaining. So the long and the short of it is, I asked him to read a page of my stuff, and he was astounded. He said, you're a brilliant wordsmith. And uh, he said, the only problem you have to do is wait for something to apply your wordsmanship to. And at this point, I haven't found a focus, so I suppose it'll end up as just another 60-year-old actor's uh, uh, life uh, of being in show business, but all the other aspects. But I think I, and I wouldn't really do it for the money. The reason I'm not even writing, I have a chance of writing, but there's so many authors in the, it's like I don't bother to learn a computer. There's so many people that know how to work a computer, I don't figure it's worth me because I have no interest in computers, so why should I learn one? And having said that, maybe I would need one, a word processor, if I was going to write a book. Except that I wouldn't do it that way. I would do a flow of consciousness and get someone who is good at typing uh, to do it. But I will have a dictaphone. Or a dictaphone. Well, in fact, I was in the office earlier on with Nick, and he asked me if he could use my dictaphone. I said, you use your finger like everybody else. And I don't know how I let myself in with that. Oh, I really don't. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, well, all this got my book. I mean, I've been promising this book for so long, whatever happens to bring it in. I have got a plot, but, a good, but continually, ever since I wrote that, some six years ago, and I haven't written it yet, I'm employed again sometimes to bring it in, be it on radio, or someone else written a book about it, and so I have to update it continually. But um, I think I'll have it done by the end of next year. If I don't, then I better never talk about it again. But, um, like, like John, I words very much and um... well it's because we work with words you know I mean I, lo I just love words that sound my first word see I, I couldn't spell uh, until I was about 28 I, had, I wasn't dyslexic but I didn't know my alphabet I couldn't work it out I couldn't go all the way through it and when I traveled I mean John won't mind me saying this because it's a long time ago but when John uh, when I used to travel across the country with him I had I told you already that I used to get migraines through the worry of you know being inadequate and all that stuff and, John used to ask me to find a, in the map, to read a map, to go somewhere. So let's say we were going to Bishop Stoughton. If I didn't know, I couldn't find it in the map because I, couldn't, I didn't know my alphabet and I used to get all hot and bothered. And John used to tell me off because otherwise you could go 50 miles out of your way by taking a wrong turning. So when I learned, I bought a dictionary and I learned one word every day and I learned the meaning of it, how to spell it and the best place to place it. And synonymous was my first word. Uh, so yeah, synonymous. I read it in a book. It said big business and corruption are synonymous. And I just thought, what, you know, what does synonymous mean? Is it a disease or whatever? So that's why I think we like writing. I must say, by the way, your questions are wonderful, actually. They've never been asked these questions before, so thank you, Bill, very much. Okay, do we have another one? Yes, thank you. We'll just get the mic, because it makes it easier. Thank you for coming, everybody. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, in your opinion, that overall with the uh, Doctor Who series from the very, the very beginning of it and up to the most recent and uh, until hopefully when it starts up again, what do you think are the uh, most menacing uh, villains or uh, aliens? And on the other side of uh, that question would be the, the funniest ones that just broke you up and uh, I'd like to get both of your opinions if possible. Thank you. Well, my, the one, ones I dislike most, I think, were the giant maggots. Because, uh, really, I don't like creepy crawlies like that. They were, they were really nasty things. I think they were the ones I wanted desperately to get rid of 
much more than some of the other ones who probably had more of a story to tell, but not the giant maggots. So, so those are the, my least favourite. Um, uh, and the most comic ones? The most comic monsters. Um, well, I found actually the, I think, those jelly babies and the three doctors. I was just going to say the ones that, I mean, what was it? Well, there was a, like a whole mass of jelly babies, you know, rather than not having a gingerbread house here, but, but you know, a whole lot of jelly babies put together. Because they did waddle a bit, didn't they? They waddled a bit. I didn't find them too frightening. Well, I, I, I liked because in a real situation, I thought the Oberons from uh, the Time Monster, the Oberons, which were half sort of man, the Day of the Daleks. I, I love the premise of that, the way you know, these huge sort of things, but I, 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 I was so busy sort of learning my lines, but sometimes the monsters didn't really figure with me. You know, we were supposed to be fighting them. I mean, I love the Yeti because the Yeti's a real thing. The Cybermen, now that they're more modernized, I think, because as you know, I played a Yeti and the Cybermen. And well, it was very nice to know that I'm the only Doctor Who actor to have played two monsters and, uh, and, and a, a human being. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I love them all in a way, but the globby ones, I think if they walked badly, I felt a little embarrassed. I think the rest of the robot in the Five Doctors was pretty neat, to use your expression. And the Daleks, because of the, oh, sorry, the Daleks, because of the effect they had on everybody. And I see Terry Nation has just done his deal with Amblin, so that if this Doctor Who has ever picked up, uh, Terry Nation said, I always knew the Daleks would conquer America. And, uh, and they most likely will. Yes, thank you. Okay, any bread? This is, this is good stuff. Oh, there's a lady right next to the gentleman that's just outstanding. And there's a gentleman over here next. Thank you, sir. Based on the fact that you had to work with different writers all the time, did you have difficulty maintaining the integrity of, of either of your characters? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, based on the fact that you had to work with different writers for almost every episode, did you have difficulty maintaining the integrity of the Brigadier or Ben? No, because on the whole, I mean, uh, when I started, and I mean, my friend Terence Dix, he was the script editor, and he would have told the writers by that time what eventually, uh, once Brigadier's catch had been established. And I think uh, I didn't have much trouble because the writers got to know who he was and probably wouldn't write many lines that would be difficult to say. And if they did, I'd ask to change them. Um, so I, on the whole, I didn't have any difficulty at all with that. Um, this is Matt Hulk and... Uh, Robert Holmes, uh, Bob Holmes, who's very good in that in our time. Um, no, but that's the answer. I didn't, I didn't have any problem because uh, they didn't, they didn't write my character in a different way. Otherwise, well, they just didn't. Uh, my case was only slightly different because I was smaller potatoes than Nick. Um, you know, Nick it was what I call the one of the leading men, and Richard and I, and well, Katie, of course, was a, you know more with the Doctor. But uh, I, I noticed the little difference when I started getting my confidence. And when, when Nick and, and John and Roger were bothered to tell me that I was okay and that I could stop worrying, I noticed that within a year of being in it, uh, having this confidence which these three gentlemen gave me with all their talent put together, uh, I, I am aware now that I was pretty good at the show. I mean, having spent 20 years thinking I was crap. But that was my version of myself. And now I look back and there are some scenes where I think I'm actually bloody good. Not, not a lot, but... I, and I look... And I see this and I thought, my goodness, I, and, and I did that under all that duress. And then so as I got into it, I noticed that they would allow me to be, they obviously got my character pretty good. You see, I saw myself as the working man, the working man soldier. I, I'm working class. I, and my voice at this moment belies it because I, I enhance my Englishness because I'm in America. Uh, but, you know, the brigadier would generally have been quite a well-off man in private life. Brigadiers often end up with big houses. Captains end up with sort of townhouses, and sergeants then usually end up drunk in a pub. Um, so I was aware that they started to realize that they, like Barry Letts was most complimentary. I said to him, how did I ever get the part, given that I was a, a little sort of like I was? And he said that one, and I didn't know this till last year when uh, Barry Letts was in, uh, in, in, in Gallifrey, in Glendale, California. And I said, Barry, could I know for, for now, how did I get the part? when there were so many, you know, what I call good actors about. And Douglas Canfield, bless his heart, we obviously love him because he was a genius in terms of the heart of Doctor Who. He was the essence of what it all meant. He was like the Jim Henson of Doctor Who, because he was a genius too. And one day, evidently, uh, uh, 
Douglas had seen me. I did a very difficult part for him. I had to play a policeman with no words, walking past a French window where there'd been a murdered body inside. And he said, you're the only walkman I think can do it. And of course, I went home that night panicking like, I thought, my God, is that when somebody says you're the only one that can do it, you think, oh God, that makes it worse, you know. Anyway, I did it. And he had stormed into Barry Lentz's office and said, I've seen a man I want to play Corporal Benton, and it's John Levine. And that's how I got the part. So when that started, I started getting a bit of respect with myself first, and, and that's the rest of it is history. That's a nice question, thank you. Okay, I'm enjoying this. Yeah, when you first started uh, playing your roles, uh, could you go out without being mobbed by kids? And I was just wondering, what was your first like first reaction when you were like? Well, uh, as regards me, uh, on the whole, when I lived. Because, to start, as you know, I had a lot of false moustaches before I decided to grow my own. Uh, a lot of false but I didn't have a moustache at that time in normal life, going to the supermarket or whatever, or going around shopping. What started to give me away is probably what you call my trademark, which is this, which is my voice, because everyone seems to know that. It's a somewhat distinctive voice, and that's when they would uh, tweak who I was. But on the whole, no, I didn't, I didn't get mobbed too much. No, I never had a problem like that. People have passed me and and said, oh, hello, Brigadier, or something, or you're on the sort of say, yes, I am. And then you know, I pass it by, and, and, and one goes on. But uh, I never had any problem of being mobbed, which um, I'm quite glad about, because it's rather embarrassing to be mobbed, isn't it? Especially if you're a Brigadier, I suppose. Well, I, I wasn't mobbed either, but I, I, I sometimes got a lot of attention because I, I am a little sort of gregarious sometimes. And I, a couple of times, for example, 54, I know there were 54 because the bus conductor told me, I got on a bus in Putney uh, to go to Barnes to pick John Pertwee up. And there were like 54 kids on this bus, all wanting my autograph on, a, on their bus tickets. And if any of you have been to England, you know that the bus ticket is just a little slip of white paper. Uh, and the only other bit of fame I had was when uh, 148 ladies uh, in, in a factory in Sheffield, because uh, you know they, they, they called me their sex symbol, which I found very hard to sort of understand. But uh, I had that, from, and that was my sort of moment of glory. Except when I was with John Pertwee, uh, I obviously travelled like more with John than Nick, because John had uh, Nick had his you know, his own life, and I was desperate to learn from John, because John was a big name in, in, in England. I mean, Wurzel Gummidge was a brilliant show. And, the Navy Lock and all those voices he did. So John is very well known. And just one very quick story about John, uh, which I always remember with fondness. We were down in Dover. Uh, we had just done um, whatever that mind of evil. Thing. And we were coming back, and I was in Benton's uniform, and I'd just been shot in the forward in, in the show. Uh, we were carrying this nuclear bomb across country or something, and we were ambushed by, uh, oh, uh, Philip Marlowe was in it, Robert Mar um, Kismet's husband, uh, uh, the prison, the prison story with the machine that sucked out all the stuff. My <laughs> people. And John was talking to us. John was uh, in his costume, because like, if you're the doctor, you might as well milk it. I mean, and the attention that John got was incredible. So John and I are both sort of six foot two-ish. John with his shocking, uh, shock, uh, shock of hair, more like six foot four. And we were cut a long story short. You have um, drug stores here. We have chemists. They're called chemists. We don't use the word drug. And uh, the biggest chemist of all in England is Boots, B-O-O-T-S, and they have a chain all across England. And John, in one of his lighter moments, because like we'd become very friendly then, and we were on our way home, and I had all this blood all dried on my face, and I'm in my military uniform, and John's in his Doctor Who uniform, and he needed to get something, I think it was headache tablets as it happens, from, you know, from working with me for too long, from Boots. And he said to me, why don't we play a gag on the people in the shop? Now, I, I tell you, I wish there had been a camera, like video cameras weren't there. If there had been a camera, I think we'd have been stars across the world. He said to me, why don't you run in as a soldier, saying someone shot you, and you need bandages and a bit of medical help. And I thought, well, John, this is a little bit over the top. I mean, you know, you're John Pertwee, I'm only John Levine. So anyway, he said, I'll run in after you, and I'll make out I'm the guy that's and, and with his cloak and his hair, and, and, I, and so anyway, we did it. Now, there's one thing, I'm quite a sort of, I, I produce now, I've been for 15 years, and I'm a good producer because I think down at the very last point, I see from the audience's standpoint first, and then I add all the technical pieces which make a good show, at uh, one hopes. So John said, look, you run in, I'll let you get up to the counter, and I'll come through the crowd of people, and as though I'm like the vampire, you know, like an interview with Benton, if you like. 
a little topical joke there, a little topical, I stick my teeth in the bubble. And so, I made one fatal mistake. I forgot that military boots have something on their soles called metal studs. And I also didn't know that the floor in boots was made of marble. Now, a smooth marble floor is not synonymous with metal studs. Well, I'm a fit guy, I run, I don't know whether you see, but I run every day, two, three, four miles, and I'm quite a healthy guy. Well, I ran in, as usual, over the top, and I ran in with such speed, I'd forgotten that the sort of rug, the carpet thing they have just in the doorway was the only grip I was ever going to get. And I went, I, I made Tonya Harding look decent. <laughs> I slid across, down through the cosmetics, I went through cosmetics, and I hit that counter with such force, I nearly knocked myself out. So I ended up on the floor with this blood all over my forehead. Now enter John Pertwee like a screaming banshee. <laughs> Obviously took the moment and doubled it, which is what John's character is. And he came up and said, I've got you now! And, I thought, well, that, and, and the rest is history because the people in the shop, the, the, the girls behind the counter were paranoid and then they realised who we were. But that one moment when I was skating, I tell you, it was awesome. I must have hit 50 miles an hour, that's what it seemed like. And I hit that counter and it was a real battle. So that was just one of those magic moments of, of uh, John Pertwee. Okay, another question, please, another last question. Yes, a gentleman over there in the blue, Debbie. Just wait for the mic, just so the audience can hear, please. Although you're only in a couple episodes with him, could you reminisce on Ian, working with Ian Martyr? That's better for Nick to start, because they were very close friends. Yes, a very close friend with um, Ian Martyr. We used to write sketches together. Uh, we used to do, we did a number of conventions in America together, as a matter of fact, here was at one, one, at least one, St. Louis, elsewhere, and uh, we used to do a double act, and we used to tease each other so much, and it was so real and so fast, that really people got very worried and said, you know, what's wrong with these guys, they don't like each other. Well, that was beside the point, because we liked each other so much that we did tease each other. But um, he was, a, again, of course, he, you know, he did many of the novelizations, and he was a, a writer, and um, uh, Smashing Chapel, I miss him very much indeed. Uh, because he was, uh, I don't know what he was, but there was a, a rapport between us which was quite extraordinary. And a lot of other people couldn't quite understand it and they, they thought that they're very different. Why, why are they such uh, close friends? And this is very curious because when I first met Ian Martin, I didn't like him at all. Because this was in the Terror of the Zygons. Uh, no, when I said I didn't like him, I'll tell you why I didn't like him. Because in the Terror of the Zygons, I suddenly saw this new uh, military type appear. And I thought, hello, 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 hello my position is being usurped. And I'm going to be usurped by a naval officer. So I was very suspicious of uh, what uh, the catch was. Well, I didn't know him during the turn of the Zygons. I think it was only um, coming across on British Airways to Chicago, like I did last week in 1983, that we suddenly got to know each other, the company John Nathan Turner, and um, got to know each other and developed this rapport. He was, uh, of course, I, I didn't do did I? I didn't do very many shows with Ian Marshall at all. Um, I think, was he a robot? Can you remind me? He was a robot, yes. He was a robot and, um, and Zygons, of course. Uh, but, you know, I got to know him very well for a period of three years and that was far too short. It was just that, you know, we used to see each other uh, a heck of a lot because I liked his company and he liked mine and we laughed a lot. He had a wonderful sense of humour, a uh, terrific sense of humour. And, uh, Humor is the best tonic. Oh, I remember Ian too. I also didn't take too much to him in the beginning because his character was not the kind of character that my kind of character would have gelled with. However, uh, when I did a show with him uh, at San Francisco or San Jose, uh, Ian was a diabetic, as you know. And, uh, I don't know much about diabetes. I just thank God, you know, I, I don't have it because needles frighten me a little bit. I was out in the, the Sequoia, or the, the big redwood forest up in, in that area, and he had gone without his medicine, and he'd forgotten, and he hadn't eaten, and he went into whatever you pour, I don't want to be patronizing, but what these poor diabetics go through when the insulin isn't in you. And I saw him go crazy, and I helped him, and held him in my arms. And, uh, and then when he died, uh, we all went to the funeral, which was a, a really, it was so overwhelming, really. I mean, Patrick and Douglas Canfield and Ian Marge, I mean, I know everyone has to die. But the irony is there's only one, Funny thing, really, I, I met um, 
um, the master, the new master, um, Anthony Ainley, in the car park on our way to see, uh, to go to Ian Martyr's uh, crematorium, uh, the cremation. And uh, we got there, and we, I always think people die sort of one at a time. Uh, and we got to the cremation, and I thought, well, you know, we're just going to see a bunch of flowers. And at that time, I bought up a job lot of little Japanese fans made of this beautiful paper, and they were beautiful things. And I'd laid one on Roger's coffin, I'd laid one on Douglas's coffin, and it was an original thing. I mean, I, not that I like to think I'm an original, but, you know, flowers are fine, but this, this fan seemed to look so glorious on, on the coffin of the three friends that we, we seem to lose. And um, I'm walking with Anthony Amy, and I, I do love Anthony Amy's sense of humor. And um, we're walking down towards where we thought Ian's pile of flowers would be, and there were piles of flowers all over the place. 22 people were being cremated that day. So we spent like half an hour looking for Ian's lot. And then Elizabeth Slade was there, who was fond of Ian, and she, I ended up sitting next to her, and she broke down, so I ended up sort of consoling her. So yeah, you know, it's always sad when you lose someone that you end up getting fond of, so. Yes, because I saw him three days before he died, who actually was awful, because his mother rang me and said, have you seen Ian? And after he left me, one Sunday, he was supposed to go around then, I said, no, it's wrong on Sunday. And, um, and of course he was found by his wife, which was brilliant. Thing. Anyway, yeah, he's a good best. Best. And he was a smashing guy, lovely. He turned out good. Okay. How the lights come out? Are you telling me you give us a message, Deb? Deb, we all want to. No, no. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. No, I, I like a darkened house. I'm used to playing the theatres, that's fine. Anyway, we, we can see if you raise a hand anyway. Oh, yeah, thank you, that's nice. Okay, well, keep the questions coming, and that's us you know, if you're enjoying it. Any more? Yes, I can see it. Uh, this is from Mr. Courtney. Um, would you have preferred your character, the Brigadier, to die off in Battlefield? Initially, you were told that he probably would die, and uh, this is for both of you. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go back, uh, God willing, how would you like to see your characters in their final appearances? Well, but first, um, yeah, the original idea in Battlefield was to kill me off, because um, John Nathan Turner, by me down to Brighton and we had a talk and he said, do you mind in this story if the Brigadier is killed off? And I thought about it for 10 minutes and I said, no, that's all right. Because he'd been around a long time, you know, and uh, as long as I had a good story to go out on. Nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I'd said that many, many years previously to Philip Hinchcliffe. I said, you don't have to inherit this character. You know, if you give me one good story to go out on, he said, no, we don't want to. And um, I, I thought, it, you know, because I, I had a sort of sneaking feeling that it would be the last time that the Brigadier would appear in Battlefield on television, a la BBC. I, I, I had that feeling. I still have that feeling, actually. Um, and so I said, fine. I, I just had an instinct about it. I said, yes, okay, get me off. But then as the script developed um, towards the end, there was so much going on that my death would have gone unannounced and unnoticed and we couldn't have that. We just couldn't have that at all. So John changed his mind and said, well, actually, we haven't decided to kill you off. And that's why John and I just bumped around the rumors that we made two endings, one where I did die, one where I didn't. Um, but, uh, uh, and anyway, you said, how would I have to come back in the final time? Well, I don't know. I, I would have to be slightly, as um, John Perkins was saying, it's slightly, as, l slightly less athletic than I used to be. If, I, if ever I was that athletic, um, and I, the character can develop very well by having a very good brain. For example, it's in the book, you know, in charge of security at Geneva. I mean, the Brigadier doesn't have to, I don't think he has to be desk bound, but uh, there are enormous possibilities. Well, this thing I'm doing next year with um, Keith Barnfather, downtime. That'll be interesting. Yes, of course, that will bring will be back, won't it? But it won't be those, I suppose, the BBC series, but we shall see what happens. Anyway, but uh, I just do what anyone, if they ask me to do it, yes, of course I will do it, and we find out how to do it. So it'll be fine. But I have to say uh, that I was very unhappy uh, in my own heart the way I was exited from Doctor Who, meaning I went on to be a used car salesman, which is the very last thing I imagine I would have been. And I thought that was rather clumsy, but that's, again, that's my own inner vanity. Um, uh, having said that, uh, I would see Benson, because a lot of people obviously see me moving up to the position of Brigadier. <laughs> I mean, well, no, <laughs> be as I am. I don't think so. Not quite, old chap. But I, uh, I, 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 well, I ended up as Mr. Benson, of course, which in English military 
very determined to be considered quite good. Warrant officer. Warrant officer. And um, yes, in terms of, um, yes, I, and I might be doing downtime too, uh, although my part isn't as big as Nick's. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I did it for you and the other thing, if you're part of it. Yes. Actually, this conversation could be extremely difficult. It's getting and I did a very little bit for you in the... Uh, yeah, carry on, go on. Um, I'm, 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 what was the other thing? Well, that's it, yeah. I did, oh, I, I turned down the five doctors um, because um, they, they insulted my character. I got the script sent from the marvellous director who phoned up in the end and thanked me for my integrity. Uh, the director of the five doctors was Peter Moffat. What had happened is I'd received the script and I had five lines out of vision. Benson's character had five lines out of vision, and my five lines were challenging the second Dr. Patrick Troughton, saying, who are you, Gov? You can't go in there. Well, I phoned up and said, I didn't work five and a half years and work my ass off to come on, even for 200 quid, and play five lines out of, out of off screen. Now, you, you must know me well enough to, now to know that it's not because I wasn't on screen. That's got nothing to do with my character at all. So they rewrote it, and it was worse. So I, I decided, out of pure integrity, that I didn't want to be involved if they were going to throw me a useless scrap because of my love for the show. And remember, the love for Doctor Who translates back into the God and Jesus thing, meaning it's good over evil. It's men that spend... When you think of the energy, like in any story on television or movies where good over evil succeeds, succeeds the energy that goes into fighting evil is enormous. If you, I mean, like, just take the Second World War. It took the whole world to put the Nazis down. So what I'm saying is, Good over evil seems to be the thing we all enjoy watching in story form. So, uh, to that end, I wouldn't be demean uh, all the energy I personally put in uh, to do five lines uh, out of camera. So, that was my. But that's not, doesn't mean to say I didn't like Doctor Who anymore. I still love the show. And that was just that one moment that I thought was a bit sad because I'd love to have been in it. Okay, we have another question, I think. Yes, just at the back there. Just to your right, Debbie. For Nick, uh, in uh, a comment on uh, your so-called last appearance, uh, would you, if this so-called uh, Fox project happens and Doctor Who does happen in America, would you be opposed or willing to make an appearance on that show if they asked you? Oh yes, I think so. Um, uh, Job is, I'm not holding my breath for it. You know, I, I still don't expect. I, I think uh, I can't visualize the whole thing happening yet in America. You know, when it happens, wonderful if it does. Um, but I don't, I think you see, well, maybe I'm wrong, I, I think it will be more to do with monsters and Doctor and Lady Companion. I don't think the whole, and it certainly wouldn't work um, unless it was British. Um, that's why I don't think you couldn't have another Brigadier. I, I really don't think you could, because it wouldn't work. So I think they might ignore the whole side of, should we say, unit, Brigadier and the character. On the other hand, they may not. Um, I'm being constantly surprised, and yes, of course, if I was offered it, of course I'd do it. Um, I'm sure I'd love to. Uh, but for your edification, uh, I had a phone call. Right. Right. I had a phone call from Peter Wang, the executive uh, casting director, having found out from Jean-Marc and Randy Lefissier, who are now the source of information uh, that Philip Siegel, the executive producer of uh, the supposed Doctor Who. And they are absolutely adamant that Unit, uh, in, in no way, shape, or form, would ever, ever appear in Doctor Who. Now, that's only he said to me categorically, and of course it sounds right. The only reason they showed a bit of interest in me is because I'm only one of two Doctor Who actors, Peter Davison being the other, that have green cards and can work in America. And Jean-Marc Officier has pushed to his, not to his credit, but so it it's made me sad, but he wants me uh, to be a time monster. They're pushing to get me a part of the Time Monster, and Jean-Marc has actually intimated uh, to Peter Wagg that this may be a possibility only if they tip their hat, as they say, to the old show. Now, I'm not holding my breath either. Just because I live in Hollywood actually means nothing at all. I mean, Hollywood is, is just a lot of dirty streets and a lot of crooked business deals, uh, and, and so the promises are so huge and the bullshit is so deep that uh, you, it's not a good place to live, honestly. I mean, it, like, I've got a movie that with Disney nearly took. I mean, it sounds so sort of grand to say that. And I would have made $1.5 million if they'd have taken it. And I'd have loved that, because I would have, I'd have left the earth and gone and lived a very quiet life, which is what I want to do now. I'm in love and happy. I just rather want to sort of breathe the fresh air of every day. But um, I, I would be excited, and I would certainly take it, 
now that I know that I'm not the worst actor in the world, and I could, I could certainly play a small part as a time monster. And of course, for me, uh, in a commercial sense, it would be astonishingly uh, financially rewardable for me because anyone, like I nearly got the part in Star Trek, you know, I mean, you know the story now when Patrick Stewart phoned me up because he'd seen a myth maker that Nick and I have done many of. And he'd seen my particular one that I directed because Keith Barfather was out of town. And I did quite a good job of it. I put some lovely humor in it and some lovely camera shots. And Patrick Stewart had seen it because he'd been approached by myth makers to do it. And the long and the short of it is, I happened to go be invited down to the studio by Patrick uh, on the day they were filming The Family. They were doing a scene with The Family, and two actors that Nicholas knows very well, Jeremy Kemp and Samantha Egger, were there because Jeremy Kemp played the main part. I don't know Samantha Egger. Oh, don't you? No. Oh, okay. Well, Nick. I comes, know Jeremy Kemp. Nick comes from the same country as Samantha Egger. And. <laughs> What's that supposed to be? <laughs> I was just winging it. And uh, Richard Allen, R Richard, uh, Richard Arnold, thank you, Debbie, who was Gene Rodenberry's right hand man, because I just met Gene Rodenberry and it was lovely having lunch with him and everything. And they said, if you had your green card, they need one more small part of an Englishman. And I was the right height and the right age. So I would have gotten it, strangely enough. Now, if I had done, of course, I would have crossed the line, which has not been done by any other actor or anybody, uh, and then I would have been in Doctor Who and Star Trek. But of course, that's far too much to have, have dreamed of. But it would have been marvelous because, let's face it, conventions, it would be lovely to sort of do work all the way through the year as opposed to being out of work, which I have. Uh, I was until I got my green card. It's been a long three years to get that green card. Uh, but I'm grateful for it now, and I thank any of you fans that may have written in. 4,580 people wrote in in the end. Uh, 4,200 of them from my mother, and the rest from <laughs> Furious eyes. But that's, uh, that's the answer to that, so thank you very much. Okay. Is that about it, uh, Debbie? Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's... Are we, are we finished? Okay. It's time. Well, you've been wonderful. Thank you for some very intelligent questions. Thank you. Debbie has just asked me...